Okay, so thanks very much for, for having us along. It's, uh, I should probably explain the title, so I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about some drugs that are in use. I'm going to talk about some of the links to sexual health. David's going to finish that off nicely for me, so I won't spend too much time. The Toilet Rolls is about some of my research out in the field. So I do a lot of uh, welfare services at dance events. So Toilet Rolls are a great commodity to bribe people to fill in uh, forms and generally do one-to-one -one interviews with me. So that's one of my techniques. Uh, so that's where the title comes from. So I've got two hats on today. I'm speaking on behalf of the Scottish Drugs Forum and I'm going to touch on some of our work at Safe and Sound where we conduct uh, welfare services. So, uh, probably no surprise to you to get the statistics on how many new drugs are coming out every year. So this is from the European Monitoring Centre. Um, so 81 new drugs uh, came out last year. As you can see, it's been on a steady increase. What I'm going to say is that doesn't necessarily mean this many new drugs are in use. So although they are being discovered, that's not necessarily what we're seeing on the ground. And actually, it's certainly not what we're seeing at the sort of recreational drug use level. So actually what I'm going to tell you today is we don't see a lot of new psychoactive substances at festivals. Where I do see them is through my work uh, with Scottish Drugs Forum. Um, and it's actually mostly in our sort of traditional settings that we would expect to see uh, problematic uh, drug use. And these drugs are just being added to the mix a lot of the time. So broadly speaking, they're all going to fall into seven categories. Um, so that's the good news. So although lots of new drugs coming out, they still fall into the seven uh, main drug categories. And this, uh, this resource is available at thedrugswheel.com, uh, done by one of my colleagues, Mark Adley. Um, so yeah, basically a legal alternative to any illegal drug that you can think of, and often numerous uh, variations. What we do also see is drugs that work quite potently um, in multiple um, uh, sections of the drugs wheel. So you've got quite a number of drugs that, for example, are really potent stimulants and also have some psychedelic effects. Lots are quite long acting as well. So obviously that has some complications, not only for people who use them, but also for people involved in support. So the different populations I'm going to talk about that use them today. Um, Homeless uh, populations, that's probably one of the biggest uh, categories that I see them in. Uh, looked after and accommodated young people services, that is without doubt the main area of my work at the moment where I get training requests. Mental health services, I think awareness is growing a little bit, um, so we're starting to get much more um, inquiries from there. And I will touch on injecting today, and I suppose different populations, again, with injecting um, drug use of uh, NPS drugs. So we're seeing people that have historically injected drugs, adding these drugs uh, to the mix, or sometimes actually transitioning onto um, NPS drugs and, and ditching uh, former drugs of choice. And then there is uh, some new populations as well. And I guess that might be one of the areas of concern um, where people maybe don't have a lot of experience uh, with injecting um, and maybe injecting practice um, is, is limited their knowledge on that. Um, David's obviously going to talk um, primarily as well about uh, some links to MSM, but in Scotland, that's certainly where we're seeing quite a lot of our new injectors. Um, and again, not presenting necessarily at drug services. We often hear through sexual health services. And then, of course, recreational drug users, people that are using drugs um, all the time um, and maybe adding these to the mix. Just touching on some of my work in night shelters. So I did a little bit of research in Glasgow last year and we're just about to start it again. Uh, this year we do some sort of homeless monitoring trends um, in collaboration with other agencies. And I thought, we'll ask about drugs. Um, so what was quite interesting, I didn't expect it to be that high, I guess, um, and nearly a quarter of uh, people that I interviewed talked about use of synthetic cannabinoids. The way in which I asked the question, in which I framed the question, really, really mattered, and that was one of my main sort of findings. So I asked people about legal high use, lots of people gave me blank looks, um, but when I actually framed it, have you used any smoking blends or gave some product names? then people became more forthcoming and actually recognised it as a drug that they'd experimented with. Um, the interesting thing was a lot of people didn't have a pleasurable experience with it. A lot of, uh, it was particularly older homeless men that I interviewed, and they talked about it being quite unpleasant, um, some of the effects of the drugs being far too intense, um, but actually, you know, they maybe would be tempted to use again, and it was very much centred around it being quite opportunistic and on being offered it, rather than necessarily seeking it out as a drug of choice. So probably no surprise that the top three drugs remained uh, probably the same as they have been for a number of years. 
So on to sort of festival drug trends. Um, so yeah, this is uh, just a breakdown. So this is from uh, a drug survey that we run um, at, at festivals, and it's actually mostly uh, events based in England. There's one Scottish event in there. Um, so you can see alcohol being very high up there, um, cannabis as well. Um, nitrous oxide is probably one that's climbed a lot, and I guess, you know, sort of reading some of the, the recent media coverage and, you know, hearing from services, I'm hearing that's pretty common throughout the UK, that nitrous oxide is maybe becoming a bit more prevalent, or maybe our awareness has just grown about it. Um, Mephedrone is probably still holding relatively um, solid as well, so it's around the sort of similar range as we would see with amphetamine. And certainly thinking about one of the events that we attended, so the Creamfields event obviously in Liverpool, 70,000 people a day. Mephedrone was one of the main drugs that people were talking about at that event, so it actually bumped up the rest of the UK statistics significantly. Um, the mystery white powder is an interesting one. So this is where people use a drug where they have um, no idea what it is. So they may not ask what it is or they may find drugs on the ground um, and use them. So quite common actually at dance events. So people maybe find uh, drugs that have been disposed of or that have been dropped and then figure, well, it's free drugs. Um, what I should say is uh, when I did this uh, work in Scotland, so this last year I did all Scottish festivals. Scotland was twice the UK average which is quite interesting. So there was something that was telling us about like cultural aspects in Scotland and maybe more likely to take those kind of risks. Uh, if I also think about people presenting in crisis at a lot of the festivals, I have to say the Glaswegian contingent was pretty high. So it was definitely the majority of people we saw were from Scotland. Ireland was a close second, I have to say. And then the rest of the UK um, after that. So that was quite quite interesting. But you can see how low NPS is in comparison uh, to some of the other traditional drugs. So basically, festival goers prefer the drugs that they always have done. So one thing I should uh, point out, um, so one of uh, my colleagues, um, uh, John Ramsey at uh, St George's Hospital, who does the Tic Tac website, did some wastewater analysis at one of the festivals that we did some trends work. And we actually found very different uh, drugs showing up in the wastewater analysis um, than we necessarily found in the survey. So one theory could be, do people know what's in their drugs? And there has been uh, some intelligence to suggest in Scotland that sometimes uh, street drugs may be claiming to be amphetamine or cocaine may be are containing uh, other NPS drugs instead. So it might be that people don't know what they're using. The ones that came out in wastewater analysis at this festival were some synthetic cannabinoids. We had methylpropamine, um, which is quite a popular uh, stimulant one and uh, drugs uh, like methadone and things like that. We also found that we gave out quite a lot of midge repellent, so deep metabolite came out quite high as well, I believe, and uh, quinine for our uh, G&T <laughs> drinkers as well. So quite interesting the things that can come out uh, through, through wastewater as well. So when I look at where people were actually coming forward for support, so bearing in mind our survey work, that's just people at the festival. So this is people actually presenting in crisis eh, because of drugs eh, or po possibly lost friends, lost keys. People get very upset about these things, particularly when they're under the influence. Eh, but alcohol by far came out the strongest, but ecstasy eh, being pretty high. And for the first kind of year um, I've seen it, um, crystal MDMA was much, much higher eh, than pills, actually. Um, saw a lot more pills at Creamfields, for example, but the other eh, southern um, en English festivals, it was much more about crystal MDMA. Ketamine was a lot lower than I would have thought, um, which is quite surprising. There seemed to be quite a lot of ketamine when you sort of wandered around the festival, but it came out quite low. But NPS, um, obviously pretty low in comparison to other drugs. So the sorts of things people present with, um, we saw a lot of serotonin toxicity complications. So all these kind of side effects that people were presenting with. Um, we have medics very close at hand, but you know people were going into such um, severe reactions that you know people were having to be medicated within our area, which wouldn't be uh, kind of normal. So these would be the sort of warning signs you'd be looking out for uh, with serotonin toxicity or stimulant overdose. Um, this is just talking about uh, pill quality. Um, so this is from uh, work done at European uh, drug checking services. Uh, so Teddy is the group that sort of uh, collate this data. 
and the pill quality has been going up. MDMA content has been increasing the last um, the last few years, really. Um, we've really seen MDMA make much more of a comeback, where we were seeing other other former uh, legal high drugs maybe being uh, used as ecstasy as well. Um, so yeah, over um, over 11 percent, nearly 12 percent found that they had more than 150 milligrams of MDMA. So that's a pretty strong pill. So dosing is the big issue, you know. So do obviously, Dr. Carroll spoke about that today as well. Um, about dosing being a real concern, and that's definitely what we see, um, not only with uh, drugs like ecstasy, but also with NPS. Uh, people are often uh, taking too much or redosing very quickly. We have had issues around PMA, obviously there have been lots of uh, warnings and things like that as well, and obviously the kind of threshold dose uh, being slightly different for that, and um, the onset being delayed, that obviously has complications uh, for people when they're redosing um, as well. Here's one tablet that we had in Scotland and all the different uh, drugs that were in that tablet. So bearing in mind perceptions of ecstasy use, you know, um, a lot of people that I work with do sort of uh, see certain drugs as better than other drugs. And, you know, there is a kind of acceptability about ecstasy, but obviously worthwhile just remembering some of the issues where we don't have access to pill testing, then ecstasy can contain different things. So obviously quite a range of compounds in that one tablet. So just talking about the different types, uh, so stimulant, uh, new psychoactive substances. Um, in the UK, we seem to like brand names. That's quite different, is my understanding from work that I've done in Europe, um, where it's much more common to buy under the chemical names. Um, so the kind of produ products that we're sort of used to hearing about, things like Gogain, which is obviously a cocaine uh, substitute. Uh, Poke, I believe, in parts of England is quite popular. Burst is a really big drug in Edinburgh at the moment, and we've got quite an issue with the people injecting this compound. Um, we find that the active ingredients actually tend to be similar things, though. So it's either methylpropamine, which is, you know, a kind of amphetamine, um, or ethylphenidate, which is an analogue of Ritalin, basically. Um, so these are the sorts of common active ingredients. Sometimes what we see with branded products is we see a mix of compounds. So it might contain something like methylpropamine and it might also have an empathogen type drug. So something like MDAI, for example, as a mix. And then our synthetic cannabinoids, that is definitely the ones that I would say are causing us the biggest problems at the moment. Um, so if we think about THC uh, being a partial agonist of the cannabinoid receptors, um, and my understanding of you know, the majority of the synthetic cannabinoids is they are full agonists, so that means that there are um, potency issues for people that are dosing. Um, and often people are talking about using quite high doses with these or, or certainly dosing in the same rain that they would with cannabis, and that's far too much. Um, so that means we are seeing more pronounced side effects. So, so much more things around mental health, uh, you know, psychosis, uh, paranoid, um, you know, delusions and things like that. Um, so that's kind of what we're seeing with the synthetic versions. And then another growing category, I guess, is unlicensed benzodiazepines. So these are used in other countries around the world, not licensed on prescription in the UK, so they fall outside our current legislation. So we had phenazepam was around for quite a long time. We have controlled that more recently. Um, so the ones that we tend to see now are atizolam and diclazepam. Again, real potency issues with these um, substances, so one milligram being equivalent to 10 milligram of diazepam. So that has real implications for dose if people aren't aware um, of that uh, dosing issue. So certainly users that I've um, interviewed, they talked about um, the tablets being very small, they're almost sugar pill sized, and them saying like they're really tiny, so I just took handfuls of them and obviously not realising to adjust the dose. Um, they do show up in street Valium as well, that is possible. Um, so that's another concern where people maybe think they're using Valium and you know, potentially using too much by accident. So I guess touching on injecting new psychoactive substances, the majority um, seem to be water soluble. Um, I've been doing a wee bit of research with these uh, recently, just doing test purchases and then preparing them uh, for injection just to see how they dissolve. Um, what I found more recently is um, some of the bulking agents that seem to be used, um, they just don't dissolve at all. So there's one product that I bought recently um, had a bulking agent, microcrystalline cellulose, which is sort of wood pulp, you know, so used in paper, used as a bulking agent for tablets and things like that. And basically, in preparing this product, 
massive amounts of residue were left in the spoon. Um, my understanding from interviewing some drug users about this is that they were feeling that they were losing a lot of the drug, so we're actually not filtering sometimes. Um, we need to do a wee bit more research and more um, uh, delving into that, but that's what I've heard sort of anecdotally from people that I've spoke to. Um, the compounds themselves do seem to be pretty irritant as well, so not only irritant to inject, but also to mucous membrane, things like that as well. The issues with people buying branded products is the, the active ingredient um, is going to change. Um, so it might, you buy um, burst one week, it might contain a different active ingredient or it might contain multiple active ingredients. Um, obviously where people are um, intravenous use, really quick onset, and some of the drugs working quite similar to cocaine in that they vasoconstrict. The kind of patterns we see with injecting, a uh, real frequency of injecting. So I've interviewed two people fairly recently that talked about cannula use, um, and this was primarily for use at sex parties, and that's just because they were obviously injecting so much through the course of the evening that they felt that that was um, a safer equivalent. How they'd found out to um, insert the cannula was watching a YouTube tutorial, so obviously not the best <laughs> uh, uh, method uh, maybe to do that, so quite high risk there as well. Um, we see real binge patterns as well, so you know, not uncommon to other stimulants. And then the implications for sexual health, people report maybe higher risk sex, uh, rough sex as well. And I should stress that whilst we sort of hear reports about this from men that have sex with men, we also hear it from heterosexual clients as well. What we do see is where people go on a massive binge is they just totally miss medication. So that might be uh, prescribed methadone, for example. It might be um, ARV medication. Um, things like that. So people report uh, these kind of um, implications. What people say about injecting, it's pretty painful. Some people talk about feeling like it's injecting some sort of corrosive uh, acid or something like that. Um, they talk about maybe not getting that many hits per site. Um, what's not clear at the moment is, is this all about the compounds? Is it about cutting agents? Is it about injecting technique or is it a mixture of all of those things? So I think there's definitely a bit more work uh, to be done. This is just some uh, of the injecting wounds recently from clients um, in, in the Lothians. Um, these are probably some of the, some of the better uh, examples of it. So we see really, really significant um, injecting complications, not unlike what we would see with other drugs, but what we are seeing them is them develop much quicker than we would necessarily expect uh, with other drug use. So I've got some quotes from people that I've interviewed. So this was someone um, who had never injected before, had been a long-term heroin user and a heroin smoker, um, and had injected this product burst, and had actually the first time that they injected, they accepted a pre-filled syringe. Um, so obviously massive uh, risk there of not really kind of knowing what to expect and injected in the groin um, as well. So you, you are seeing quite high levels of risk taken with some of, some of the compounds. Uh, this was someone that um, I interviewed about chemsex. So they were just talking about sober sex, not cutting it anymore. And I'm sure David's going to kind of touch on, um, you know, certainly some of his clients and some of the implications uh, for his clinic. This one, so a synthetic cannabinoid user. So this was quite an interesting client because this was someone that had been a really long-term cannabis user and actually had switched to synthetic cannabinoids because they worked in the rigs in the north of Scotland and had got a job, um, was going to get drug tested. So that's, that's useful sometimes just thinking about why are people choosing NPS? We're hearing it's not so much recreational drug users, it's actually more people that are maybe already in services or potentially um, people that we don't know about as well. And part of the drivers for use seem to be around, you know, availability, um, price um, and this factor that they may not show up in drug tests. It's generally not on preference is my understanding with the majority of clients I work with. Uh, the last one, that's got to be my, my personal favourite. So this was someone at a festival um, and they said that their vision went purple for about uh, 10 hours. It felt a lot longer than 10 hours because I remember going off shift, coming back and they were still going strong. So um, yeah, so quite, quite potent effects from that one. So harm reduction, really important to just touch on that. Um, Obviously, when we're thinking about um, injecting as well, um, thinking about some of the other routes, um, and then also 
the standard harm reduction stuff that you give out for safer consumption of all those routes, so exploring for people the benefits of using orally, um, and it was interesting what, what Dr Carroll was saying this morning about, you know, maybe people start to prefer different routes uh, at different stages in their life as well. Um, so exploring why are they using a certain route, what are the benefits for them, and what are the ways to reduce some of those risks. So obviously thinking about safer uh, smoking, safer sniffing, um, Rectal administration may be appropriate uh, for some where they're, where they're injecting as well. That might be an alternative for them. Um, other things you need to think about, um, so bearing in mind they're going to dissolve in water, um, or most of them should, that's absolutely where people should start. See how they dissolve in water um, and see how they get on with that. Um, so they probably are not going to need citric. So one of the products, I used two sachets of citric um, and it made absolutely no difference whatsoever. I hear from a lot of my clients, so they are using citric. Um, so obviously where they're using citric and it's not needed, that causing all sorts of implications. They're also not going to need heat. People talk about some of the compounds solidifying in the barrel uh, where they've uh, applied heat. So although it might dissolve temporarily, it then sort of comes back together. Filtering drugs, an absolute must, um, particularly after my more uh, kind of recent um, experiments. So the filter syringe, for example, seemed really, really effective uh, for use um, uh, for new psychoactive substances. Obviously, stuff you already give out about rotating of sites, um, and most importantly is about the dose. And you can see we've done this sort of comparison to a match um, just to contextualise it for people where you're talking about people particularly being really under the influence or on massive, you know, four-day binges as well, judging by eye is going to get even more challenging. So if people can be using scales, that's, that's great. But if not, if they've got some sort of visual scale so they can work out uh, what the active dose might be, that's, that's useful. So just touching on, um, sorry, different needs of clients. Um, Bearing in mind some of our new psychoactive substance users, we are seeing some new populations, they are much less likely to come to a drug service. Um, and part of that's about maybe not seeing their, their use being um, problematic, not necessarily seeing these in the same vein as other drug use. Um, clients much more likely to be in employment, education, housing. Um, a lot of clients I've worked with are, you know, maybe minimise uh, problems uh, to do with their use or don't connect it with the drug use as well. Um, and then, you know, kind of all the things that we normally see, multiple needs and the sort of different levels of risk taken with different groups. So what are the barriers that people tell me about um, access and services? A lot of uh, mainstream services still have um, opening hours that are like nine to four, half four or whatever. It just doesn't fit with a population um, that maybe is um, in employment, for example, and just can't access in those hours. So out of hours clinics really important. Um, people talk about not seeing their use as a problem. Um, again, where people are maybe in employment or there are um, other factors, they may be really worried about confidentiality issues. They also have less awareness of what services offer, um, so they're not in the system, possibly, some of the newer users. People talk a lot about services being set up for our traditional drugs, so you know a really strong opiate focus, or maybe uh, you know maybe used to de dealing with cocaine and crack cocaine, um, but maybe not dealing with some of the newer drugs. The branding of the service is really important for that, so I don't know uh, how it is here, but certainly in Scotland we love things like the drug problem service, the addiction service. You know, it's just the wording isn't particularly um, embracing of people that maybe don't see their use as uh, problematic. So thinking just a question for you, you know, does your current service provision appeal to new psychoactive substance users? So obviously bearing in mind you will have this mix of people already in service, maybe using these drugs, but potentially new populations. Some of the things I would suggest, engage with new users, uh, think about um, how easy access is, think about more specific services, and we've got some great examples. We've got things like the Club Drug Clinic, um, crew based in Edinburgh that are tailored to psychostimulant users. Think about those interagency partnerships. So, for example, embedding sexual health uh, with drug services, more cross working with mental health and drug services as well. Think about how friendly your service environment is to potentially new populations. Um, assessment as well, how you frame your questions about some of these drugs is really important. Um, think about how close to the scene you are. Um, user involvement, always a great thing to do. Um, and you know, involving them in design of the service and maybe um, 
you know, tweaking the service as well. Just before I finish off, I'm going to touch on the media reporting um, and how that kind of drives NPS use. So there has been uh, some research, and I can't remember what university it was now, but they talked about, um, you know, every time there was kind of headlines, uh, use was spiking in some certain areas. So we, we have here um, extra strong ecstasy pills. So the police happened to tweet this out at a festival I was at, and then all I had all weekend was everyone going, where'd you get those pink ones that were tweeted out? So six times stronger ecstasy, I think, was the tweet. So obviously how that communicated to people was like, that's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> then we've got this next one about um, the, this legal highs left someone naked in Tesco, you know, uh, these things that happen. Got to be my favourite about uh, ripping your scrotum off as well. So I'm, I'm not sure of the accuracy of that claim. Um, and more latterly, I've been uh, the victim of this myself this week. So one of my injecting uh, booklets that I wrote in combination with the NHS, uh, the Daily Record and the Sun got hold of it, even though it's been out for a number of months, and got quite excited about the fact that we'd uh, talked about rectal administration. It's on the back page, interestingly enough, so they skimmed over about 10 pages of the booklet and got very excited about the rear elements of it and all sorts of headlines about bum advice and things like that, so it was absolutely ridiculous stuff. So, um, just to talk about different uh, publications, so our injecting uh, booklet is on our website. Um, this is it here. It's free to download and uh, feel free to use and adapt it. Um, publications that you can get, uh, Mike Linnell's uh, publications, again, available on Exchange Supply site. Uh, obviously, HITS publications as well, so I saw them on display today. Uh, the CRI uh, website, Strange Molecules, the, all places to get more sources of information. And also just highlight Drug Watch, which I don't know if people are aware of, but it's just a forum um, that's basically, you know, workers in the field that um, wanting to create a, basically a bottom-up early warning system was the idea. Um, and we run it with no funds whatsoever, and we create drug briefings, um, and they're available on various websites, including SDF's website and Drug Scopes as well. So that's my acknowledgements, and I think that's me. Um, I'll put up my contact details. Anyone that wants to come to a festival, please come and see me. I'm doing quite a few next year, and I'm always looking for volunteers. Uh, and thanks very much for listening.